what I'm going to go through here and then the conversation that we'll have and the input from Alex and then the breakout is a, it's, it's a dialogue, the entire thing. It's a fact finding also for me so that I can think along with Mikey and other people in the space about what are the resources and what's the programming um, that we should look to provide for you to help support your success. So that's the overall framework. Since many of you didn't go to the conference or didn't have the opportunity to go to the conference, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the way we see transformative technology so that you have a view of this space. I'll introduce my path just a little bit and some other things so then we can, when we get into the, um, the Alex's talk, questions to him, some of the feedback that I've gotten from TransTech investors, and then the breakout, you'll have all of the context that you need, okay? So for those of you who don't already know me, my background is I was in video games for 14 years, and my last role was overseeing operations for World of Warcraft China. So one of the most successful role-playing games in the world and the largest branch of that game in the world. And then I went on a meditation retreat and I had an awakening. And in, it was Vipassana, southern Japan. In 10 days, I had a profound shift in the way that I experienced reality in the sense that one, I was incredibly happy and I thought I was happy before, but in hindsight, I realized I was optimistic. And I was also fearless. And a lot of that came down to, now I understand, a dramatic drop in self-referential thinking and rumination. So I didn't have the inner chatter anymore that told me about all the things that might happen or it happened in the past. And so because of that, I became incredibly curious. One, uh, I needed to know what happened to me because at that point I didn't have the network or the language or the friends to like, understand it. I'd kind of just gone to this meditation retreat because two of my friends had gone. Um, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't anticipate what happened having happened to me. And so I walked out of the retreat with this overwhelming sense of joy and this incredible level of fearlessness. And the first thing I wanted to do was to share it with the people that I loved and that I cared for. And so my first thought, because you know, one of the things about World of Warcraft, if it's about anything, it's about scale. My first thought was, oh, I want to scale meditation. And then after that, I wanted to scale the benefits of meditation. So self-awareness and the ability to connect with other people. And then as I started to get into the psychological data and really sort of see on a global level what's happening to the minds of mankind, I wanted to scale what we now, the way we now define transformative technology, which is uh, mental health, emotional well-being, and human thriving. And so this is the way that we approach it. And at the lab, at Sophia, we do three things. One, we do basic research. Dr. Jeffrey Martin, who's my co-founder over there, does support the postdoctoral work of lots of um, PhDs who are working on psychology and tech. We've got two medical grade EEG machines. And so we do basic research. The second thing is we create community and that's the purpose of the conference. And the third part that we're ramping up now is finding resources for entrepreneurs. And so that led to the conference and the lab. And the first year we had 350 people, the second year 500, and then this last year we had just over 600 people. So it's growing and the community, of course, are people like you. Also, a neuroscientist, one of my ongoing jokes is that every time a Vipassana course lets out in Northern California, there's another 40 people who want to start a transformative technology business. When I'm overviewing the space, I like to ask the question, what is the next human agenda? And Yuval Harari with Homo Deus, how many people have read that book? Okay, for everyone who hasn't read it, you should read it. Um, he says the next human agenda is longevity, happiness, and augmentation. 
And so I think, you know, happiness, because he actually is a very serious meditator. He spends a month on retreat every year. Happiness is kind of a, uh, I think it's the word that you use so people have a sense of what you're talking about. But when you read the book, and then based on what I know about his own practice, there is something more fundamental under happiness, and it's this definition of fulfillment, meaning, belonging, purpose, self-awareness, connection. If you're watching the global data, the global psychological data, the rise in these conditions worldwide is accelerating and is going across countries, cultures, cohorts. I mean, it's really, it's, a, it's, it's kind of uh, shocking and sobering how quickly these things are rising, and you probably have all seen a lot of the data on it. The way that we look at well-being and the mission of transformative technology is we really see it in three pieces. The first part are people who need human support. So this is stress, anxiety, depression. And then in the middle, you have the human condition. This is adulting. You know, this is the process of experiencing life and then processing it. So loneliness, connection, empathy. There's some really interesting things happening here. And then this far side is exponential well-being. Your gifts truly unlocked. Persistent non-symbolic experience, which is the academic term for enlightenment, oneness, awakeness, transcendence, unity, consciousness. But this entire section is about how do we discover and push into the next level of what's possible for humanity. And what's exciting about the trans tech space is that there are people who are working across this entire spectrum. And what's even more exciting is that a lot of the software and hardware also works across the spectrum, which I think is really, it's really exciting. I love the multi-use of things. You know, specifically within this community and the number of people in Conscious Hacking who are also meditators, I just wanted to take a moment to put up the, you know, the goal of eradicating human psychological suffering. And one of the things that struck me when I read Homo Deus is that, because I'd actually stopped talking about this so much and had spent more time talking about stress and other things that were on sort of like the, the, the edge where people outside of our community are dealing with these things every day. And then I read that book and it was like, oh, we actually really need to go to, we need to go for this. Um, and in the past where it might have been a luxury to go for this, um, it's now, humanity's in a place where it's a requirement. And so you guys are really key to that, no matter where you're working on the spectrum. And so if technology is that force that takes something scarce and makes it abundant, then it should also be for these three categories, mental health, emotional well-being, human thriving, and what we need are things that are scalable, accessible, and affordable. And that's really where the core of conscious hacking and how I see this community fitting in. So a lot of these things are driven, as everyone might imagine, by exponential technology. One of the things that's really surging is the power of uh, understanding that can come from the massive psychological data sets, also known as Facebook. Um, but there's a lot of other things out there. You know, technology is not deterministic. We can decide how it's used. Um, but there's a lot of power in being able to um, understand someone and then surface that information back to them for them, which I think is one of the, you know, defining characteristics of the way that we think about the world. So the key drivers that's really driving it just this last year, because I sort of like watch all the companies and, and the trends, is that the healthcare costs are rising. What's really interesting is for the first time, you have a lot of the private healthcare systems who support corporations really diving into accepting preventative healthcare. Now, I mean, they're doing it because they want you to be at work and they don't want you to pull on the system, but they're doing it and that's actually what really matters. Uh, providing meditation and yoga and open to lots of hardware, software devices if the companies that provide that can give them the privacy um, and the data um, or, or progression metrics that they need in order you know, to match their HR systems. 
Then consumer demand, you really see it. This is coming off the psychological data. And then just in every domain, just the domain expertise that's, that's growing in neuroscience and behavioral psychology and a bunch of other things. So, you know, I've seen in the last four years fundamental step ups in all of these categories of what we know, what we can do, what's possible. Some of you have seen this slide before. These are all of the areas, the major areas of transformative technology that we track. And I'll make sure that they have these slides and, or we'll put this all online. But I think the way that I really think about it and what's exciting is that it really is a new use case. It's a new design focus. And it's a way to um, think about the things, many of the devices and understandings that we already have, and then direct them towards inner development for this rise in well-being that we need in order to solve the problems that are facing mankind. And so just to give you a quick overview of some of the things that I'm interested in um, and what's possible, and also, you know, if you haven't decided what your trans tech company is, just to give you a sense of the range of things you can do. There is emotion recognition, pattern recognition. Many people don't know that one of the top requests to Alexa is Alexa help me relax. It's in the top third. It popped in there in January. Initially, Amazon thought it was an anomaly. And then in March, it stayed steady. So it's been there. And so intelligent assistants, you have, uh, you have depression bots, inspiration bots. My replica just started asking me about my mood two weeks ago. This one is a digital girlfriend. You know, why not? I think it's OK. Loneliness sucks. Um, <laughs> then you have mood management, focus, you know, you can do, a lot of people take qualia, uh, there's smart pills, uh, transcranial direct stimulation, sound, I use focus at will every day. Um, I love BFB Labs, I'm really excited about these guys because they've created a digital trading card game that is tied to a heart rate variability sensor that goes on the ear. It's really simple, but what they do is as you play, the faster you drop your heart rate, the more control and the, and the greater power your spells have. While I think it's really important to teach children how to meditate, in this case, you just, they're playing a game. And the way that you optimize is to learn how to use um, your, how to self-regulate your physiology, which you all know that when your adrenaline spikes, when you get scared and your adrenaline spikes, then it just takes your mind offline. So, the, so they're sort of like, this is a very scalable tool and it's a very simple way um, to sort of get in there. There's wearables, all-in-one trackers. Um, you probably saw, for those of you who came to the conference, you saw that Muse now has glasses where they've packed everything in there. So everything that used to be in here is now in here and you can have these as prescription glasses. You know, eventually I expect that there's gonna be everything else in there. They already pick up everything off the phone. Then there's sleep and meditation and uh, healthy calming spaces. You know, there's some really interesting things from a medical standpoint. A lot of progress has been made and a lot of, one of the areas that's really starting to be taken very seriously is circadian rhythms and its effect on stress and health. Um, and uh, from a medical standpoint, taken very seriously, like real science, real medicine. And then of course, VR, AR. I, I'm, I'm curious about whether or not we can increase the number of people that can be in group versus out of group. So it's a sort of like a neuroscience um, thought that um, 150 is the max, but maybe we're changing. Um, I think it's important in terms of the world that we live in to the extent that people see more people being on Team Human. So I'm curious about it. This is really exciting. This is EQ Radio. It's a emotion recognition based off of an RF signal, essentially kind of like wireless picking up emotion. And, but the thing that's important is that the efficacy level of detecting emotional state or arousal is equivalent to on-skin ECG. This is Ming Po. All of you should be tracking him. It's like this is only one of his projects. Like the guy's just coming up with one interesting thing after the next. And then of course, increasing human capacity. And I'm really inspired by Tim Mullins, who you guys have seen at a lot of events 
the really important thing to know about his work is he's doing for you, for TransTech, what Amazon Web Services does for general tech by having cloud-based signal processing that any entrepreneur um, could use. Um, basically gives you the kind of processing power for your products that a year ago you could not afford probably. So this is the, the way th all of these categories fold into this and you can find it online. It's the market map for TransTech. I scraped Crunchbase and all of the Kickstarters to you know, figure out how much money um, had been invested in this. And it's a dirty number in the sense that there's lots of companies where you can't find out how much money has been invested because it's just not listed in a public source. I basically would have to talk to all of them. And this number also removes the anomalies. So like you'll see Facebook is on here. And you know, like it or not, there's a lot of things that Facebook has moved forward. For example, we now know that emotional contagion is a real thing, not a theory. Um, and then the power of the chat bots uh, Wobot runs on top of Facebook, and so that's where people are, and the ability to talk to um, a bot that's focused on depression, you know, that's important. It's important. So they're on here, but their funding's not included, so we took out all the anomalies. This might seem like a lot, but this is how much goes into startups every year. So it's actually not a lot. This is the 1.6 is life to date, as far as I can find, um, and the 160 is you know, globally, what goes into startups. So what this session is about is how do we get and you get a larger piece of this? How do we make sure, what can we and you do in order to help you become investable so that you can participate in that and build real companies and not just talk to investors? Like a lot of stuff is like, what do you say? Um, I'm more interested in what do you be so that when you say something, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, you're already the types of companies that people would want to invest in. And so with that, these are my goals with tonight uh, and then also over the next few weeks. Um, I've uh, interviewed so far 11 deep, long interviews with investors and we have Alex who's going to talk in a moment and I have another big set to do. I also really want to understand, you know, what are the needs that are unique to our community, um, if there are, and um, also really what's the programming that we need. Because the sooner the companies in this sector work to become investable, then the sooner that we build companies that help people. So with that, my friend and brother, Alex Lloyd. I've known Nicole a long time, and I was there when she got back from her first meditation retreat, and it was infectious, and I decided to meditate after that. And I've been meditating pretty consistently for five and pretty almost every day for three years now. Actually, I meditated right before I came here, and I was thinking about our conversation, it just kind of as things come up, sometimes you meditate. And, and I, I think the question, I mean, I'd be glad to talk about what it means to be investable these days. I mean, I have kind of my thoughts about that, but I, I really want to maybe talk about how funding and raising money and all that is transforming. So maybe it's transformative funding because if you want to go talk to financially motivated investors, that's a very specific type of thing, which I, I run a VC fund. I, uh, I've probably invested in over 100 companies since 1998. I'm older than... I look, I hope. And that's a very specific type of uh, way to raise money. But I think that we need to think kind of beyond that. If it, um, Things are changing in funding in a way that I, don't, I haven't seen so much change in my entire life of investing, which is almost 20 years now. Um, you know, it started with things like AngelList where there, and, and crowdfunding and Kickstarter. I think the way that, the, that things are valued on the internet and the way that um, even the attention economy that we've built with Facebook and Twitter and all these things, I think that's just about to change in a big way. And I, I think it's because um, it's new technologies like blockchain and coins are really going to change the way that we interact with each other. If the internet was really exchanging information between two people freely, um, blockchain will enable 
exchange of value between two people or two companies in a way that really hasn't happened before. Because the internet was structured in a way that everything was free, the only thing that you could really have as value was attention. And therefore, these big companies uh, got created that were focused on getting people's attention because attention and ads were the way that everything was fu were f was funded. But I think in the next generation of the internet and, the, and therefore the next generation of society, that's not as true as it was before. And there'll be a lot of other ways that you can garner interest, profits, whatever you're trying to create in your company. And I, and I, and I want to challenge you to all be as creative as possible in trying to find sources for funding. There has never been more ways to get money to get your idea out there than there is today. And I think those ways are changing at an exponential rate. So there'll be more and more ways that you we don't even think about today for you to raise money. So don't think like, oh, to be successful, I need to go find do an angel round. And then after that, I need to do a series A. And then after that, I need to do BC. And then I need to go public and I need to be a unicorn. We were having discussion of this about this and she was and Nicole was saying like, well, is it important to be a unicorn or not a unicorn? It is very important for venture capital funds to have unicorns in their portfolio because half or 80% of the companies of half the companies are going to fail and another 40% will just give them some nominal money back. And then that last 10%, they need 100x to get 10x on the rest of their fund. So you're talking to very specific types of companies that may or may not be trans tech companies, certainly some of them all. But if you guys are all entrepreneurs and you're all trying to get to, to be successful, you all need to build unicorns. The thing about unicorns is there's just not that many of them. So don't structure your whole company in order to be a unicorn and have to raise all this money. Think of all the creative ways, which we can, um, in question and answer, I'll be glad to take questions. What are the creative ways that you can fund a company? Now, if you are going in, um, down the road of talking to investors like me um, or other larger investors, I think there's a pretty good formula for doing that, and it's very simple. I think we all are creatures that learn through stories. Your story should include these three things. It should talk about what's wrong with the current system, like you know, Jack and Jill can't fall asleep at night. So what do they do? Um, Richard invents sauna, which is a, a great mask that create, that lowers your your um, state into theta waves, and you can now fall asleep. and And Richard is able to sell millions of these and make money. So first thing, what's the problem? How are you going to solve it? And then how are you going to make money solving that? And if you can weave a really nice story around that, that people can remember and that resonates with them and they can understand the problem and they believe that you can fix that problem with your solution, your tech solution, and that th then you can sell it and make a lot of money, that's a kind of a good, very um, simple way to think about how you're going to get money from venture capitalists or angels or, or financially driven investors because that last component is really important. They want, to, want you to be able to make money because they want to make money for their investors. Um, so that's a really important thing to think about. Tell a story about how you're going to solve this problem and why you're going to make money. And why is making money, of it, making money important to these investors? Because they have a fiduciary responsibility. They've taken money from other people, usually, unless it's an angel writing a check out of his or her pocket. Um, and they need to generate a return for them. So they're looking for companies that are going to hopefully, hopefully propel that and uh, be, they'll be able to return money to their investors. But that's a very small um, number of financing that go there. And I think uh, the numbers she put up there, the interesting thing is I think a, a smaller and smaller um, percent of those are going to be um, these traditional VC rounds and traditional financing. That's going to be reserved for a specific type of company. And if specific type of companies get created because of that, and a lot of very virtuous types of companies might not get funding that deserve to exist. So don't build your company in order to get VC funding. Build a company that you think can change the world. And if VC funding is the right way to do it, do it. If you think Kickstarter, a Kickstarter campaign is the right way to do it, do that. Maybe, I mean, I'm very skeptical that um, these initial coin offerings, I'm sure if some of you have heard of this, I mean, a lot of those probably are, are, are going to go away. But the idea that blockchain and that um, 
public and, and um, group funding of ideas is going away, that I, t I, I think that, that is the future. So just be creative in the way that you get money. And talking to people like me or even larger funds, that's just one thing. And it's by no means needed or, or a sign of success. Um, it's just some smart people, sometimes smart people thought what you're doing is right, but that doesn't mean you're going to succeed. And be creative and, and try and f be successful, not only through VC funding, but a lot of other ways. So that, um, I wish I sat down with Nicole a little bit longer because I thought her slides looked amazing and I'd love to put slides to this and she obviously knows how to make cool slides. Um, but that's all the prepared remarks I have. Um, I'd love to take questions and you know, if there's any specific uh, stuff about financing, I I'd be glad to talk about that. Alex and I were talking about tonight and uh, we were talking about the potential and the promise of this sector. When I think about making money, I don't think about it as, oh, you know, we're in it to make money. It's that if you have a product that you sell to people who need it and they pay you for it, and the requirements and the thinking that you have to do to develop a product that people will buy, that action of making money in that way is the thing that increases the likelihood of you being a sustainable business of you being around because so many startups fail. And so changing the mindset, what you really, the way you clarified it for me, is changing the way people define what making money is. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you're in it to make the money like that. It means, yes, I have a product that the market wants and people will buy and I'm willing to go through the operational rigor in order to build that thing. So in that way, making money is very important. And so I just really love that nuance, if you could speak to that. I'd say that the, there's one part of that which is really important. I think you're, as CEO or founder of a company, um, your number one job is not to run out of money because that means that your, your runway is over if you have to go back and work at your day job, another job and give up your dreams. So, you know, if you have um, capital that, and you have more at-bats and you can keep going, then money means more opportunity for you to keep trying and be successful. Um, and there is, and I think this is changing, but I think, um, you know, if you have a product that people want and you're able to sell it at a price that you can make money at, then that's a really good sign that you're on the right track. And, um, uh, but, but I think with this new kind of, um, uh, you know, there's other things that are of value, right? Which is, like I was saying, the attention economy or um, other ways. I think that, I think this is going to transform over time. But you have to create some type of sustaining business. If you look at all, I think all the companies that have made the most difference, they created kind of this wheel that over time. Um, just grew because it was this, this kind of self-sustaining thing. Now, of course, you can get injections of capital, but if you're if you're you know, it's, it's a really good test whether you have something that people want if they're willing to buy it and pay for it. There are ways around that. I mean, if you can really, um, there are alternate ways of funding that. Like if you have a really great product vision and you can put together and you can convince 10,000 people to give you, to pre-sell, in a pre-sale to buy, you know, a thousand dollar product, then maybe you can get your $20 million that way. Um, but I think from traditional VC, it's going to be hard to come in and, and just raise $20 million uh, for your, or I'm just making a high, what I consider a high number. Um, so you might want to figure out ways to kind of tell that story or prove your market out, out a little bit. The, the other part of that is I think a lot of people think, well, I need to develop something to prove that it works. But think of it more as I need to prove out certain things. Like do I, what are the things I need to do in order to de-risk this? You could take out Google ads and prove there's demand for something and kind of hack your way to that without even having a product. So there's a lot of ways, again, that you can hack the system and get, um, get proof points without having to build a $20 million product. Free product is the best strategy. If you can give something, if you can afford to give away something for free and millions of people love it and then you can start charging it for it, that's great. But it can be very expensive to do that. So I think... Um, then there are areas where if you can prove out a market for free, then you can jump into a profitable market, um, freemium models, things like that. But it's, I think, you know, 
you you don't control your own destiny in, until you're kind of have raised enough money or are in some type of business where you have some type of break even and you can keep going and keep trying things. So if you, if I don't know what your product is, but if you give a, enough of it away, you can generate demand. But in the end, unless you have unlimited money, you're going to have to turn on some type of system. And it really depends on what, you know, eyeballs are very valuable now. Um, you know, so if it's some web-based product that might work, but if you're giving away like a hundred dollar hardware device, it's a completely different story and, be, and you, you just can't afford to scale that up. But that's certainly a valid way to uh, approach it is to give something away for free if you can afford it. So the question is, how do you move from an attention economy to a non-attention economy? And I think that um, if you think of how the internet was developed, it's a lot of, it's basically a, a, a a peer system where whether it's traffic or um, atten or attention or it's ba everything's basically people expect everything to be free and so f so the thing of value is people's attention on that um, I think if you have a imagine a uh, a next generation internet where for very little cost I can give you a penny and or for, I can pay for a little bit more security or I can pay for a little bit more privacy. And it's not om almost paying, it's almost transparent to me. Um, then you, it really opens up a lot of different models where you know the advertising isn't the end all be all. And you can do very, uh, you can exchange value in other ways. It can be uh, storage, it can be actual money, it could be, there's a lot of things of value that you can't value on the internet because there's no real pricing ne mechanism because you have to enter a credit card and it, you know, the minimum transaction is $5. But imagine a system where there's really an, a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value between any two actors on the internet. And then it really opens up a lot of business models that weren't there before. Yeah, I think blockchain technologies, I don't know if it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other thing that we don't even know about yet, but I think all the all those technologies are going to enable a next generation internet that looks very different than the one now. If you take, for example, um, Tor, Tor is an anonymous browser uh, solution that's used um, in a lot of third world countries where people can access the, the internet without their government overseeing them. Um, the issue with Tor is all that is being donated for free, like all the bandwidth is being donated for free. I'm working with a company that, um, use, uh, it's called Mesh Technologies. They, they are enable uh, you to, to actually, with, through coin and blockchain and Ethereum, um, value the, uh, the bandwidth in a way that's anonymous and um, uh, so people that put input into the system, it can actually get something out. So when, when you think about these types of things, they change the way the fun, fundamentally the internet works. And I think the internet, when there's easy value exchange between actors, is going to look very different when, than when there isn't, which is now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The, um, so um, the next thing, I'm just going to take you through a few slides from some of the people who couldn't be here. <laughs> Uh, who couldn't be here, and you'll see, thank you. and you'll see a couple of categories. And so this was the investor interviews, and um, there's, you know, there's more focused attention on this space now. And so here's some of the thoughts that they have. So it's solving a problem bigger than your own or your hardcore friends. We're so hardcore, this group. Um, and so I thought this was interesting to keep in mind. Sustainable business, really know your unit economics. Uh, one of the people said, you know, I've, I've, that they've talked to people in our space who have a, um, it's gonna cost them $200 to build something, but the price point is $100, and they haven't thought about how to close that gap. A lot of the pitches, 80% are product focused. And I think a part of that for us specifically is because we're creating a new space and in a new space, we spend a lot of time thinking about what should the product be because we're kind of the only ones thinking about it. But, you know, what this just says is, you know, really start to think about some of those other things too. Um, and, you know, and really thought these through. Scientific and medical validation, if it's something that you're, if you're working on something that's in that area, even if you're not going for FDA, 
um, but just to know that it really works and that your solution is superior to the current ones. And so doing the work to have a truly differentiated IP. One of the things that was mentioned about some of the sleep solutions that are out there is that one person was like, you know, when you talk to the person, they haven't actually read the NIH grants that are out there. Um, they haven't talked to people in the sleep labs around the country at the universities. They don't actually know what's coming. Um, and so it's like, this is an example of, you know, really have a truly, think about having a truly differentiated IP. And a lot of this is basic, but the reason why I wanted to share it with you is because it's from the investors who say they want to invest in this space. So it's, it's general advice, but it's super relevant to us. Be heart and data driven. So, you know, one of the remarks is that there's, you know, really extraordinary, very passionate people, but when you start to talk to them about the numbers, they're more heart than data driven. And so this person was like, I really want to see both. We kind of talked about this before. Almost every single investor said the same thing about having real business rigor around your business. And the reason why I think this is important is because, you know, I have a sense of urgency about what we need to create in order to balance the world out. I think we have roughly 15 years to either have Star Trek or Hunger Games as our future. And so the success of your businesses is really important to me. And my view is that the more business rigor you have, the more likely you are to survive the natural attrition that happens across all startups, not just do good startups, but all startups. And so what that means is that as a community, we have to really sort of dig in on the business rigor part as well. Diverse teams, uh, I thought this was funny, your meditation friend might not be the right person. Um, <laughs> it's just a good point for diversity, cognitive diversity, stylistic diversity, because you're gonna have so many problems to solve. You'll need people who think about them in different ways. This was from someone who does a lot of impact investing. A lot of the impact investors are starting to look at trans tech because it feels very similar in there. They're seeing in many cases, the wider psychological issues that are affecting society are affecting the effectiveness and the success of their impact investments towards the environment, poverty, these other things, especially, I mean, lots of other things. So the impact investors are coming in. And uh, one pers person I talked to said that one of the things that all of the big impact investors talk about is that by time they get a startup, by, or by time a company gets to them, that sometimes the cap tables are really messy and it's really hard for them to, to, to invest. And, and this person said, you know, I think it's because it's sometimes so hard to have a company that's doing something different that the people are really scrambling in the beginning. And so they, and they haven't necessarily really spent a lot of time thinking about what an investment strategy should look like, that the way that they've sliced up their company internally and externally makes it very difficult for other people to come in. Be careful, don't marry everyone you date. This is, I th this is interesting, um, and this gets into the more spiritual things of what people are looking for. The, the ability to know the difference between wants and needs and the willingness to build a business that's for needs. So the way this was described to me, it's the difference between sugar and nutrition, the difference between sex and connection. It's always difficult to build a business, but to build one that satisfies just wants uh, versus building one that, you know, the want might be the entry point, but it is designed to fulfill a need, a true need. This I thought was interesting. Um, good for society. This is a person who's looking for, you know, really scaled social outcomes because there's a lot of products that I've seen and that I use that are good for me as an individual. Uh, but this was someone who was saying, I want to see things that are good for society as a whole. I thought this was interesting. Meta level contextualization of what, how what you're doing is good for the spirit of mankind. Now, it doesn't, you know, get rid of the need to be able to say, you know, Jack and Jill have this problem and this is how this product addresses it. But this person was like, I want to know how that storyline fits into the spiritual development of mankind on an overall level. This was interesting. You know, if you're talking about having a transformative product, make sure that you're doing the work yourself. 
awareness of the value of coaching. One of the things that is interesting is there's two and more that I, I know about of uh, investors who bring coaching in with the funding. And so um, they want the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur's team to be on a personal development program. Um, and they see that as their way of de-risking the investment. You know, um, and so they want entrepreneurs who are excited about this. And, you know, finally, that it's an emerging market. And so what was, you know, consistent around everyone is that they were willing to get in there with you and um, help build your businesses. So I think, you know, really developing and, and focusing on, on upping our operational rigor um, and some of the other things we've talked about, um, the investors have arrived um, who are willing to support you.